Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Shirley Mun. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, today I chose a topic that is close to the heart of uh, UC San Diego. As many of you may be aware, uh, Professor Roger Revelle, who was instrumental during the formative years of UC San Diego, was also one of the first scientists in the world who studied uh, greenhouse gas effect and uh, global warming. So um, I hope I will take the next few minutes to update you what UC San Diego has accomplished in the last few years. So I'm an engineer who specializes in energy storage technologies, namely batteries. Right, so not all the batteries are the same. I'm sure all of you are very familiar with batteries, or at least you think you do. Um, <laughs> everyone has a handheld devices or laptop that are being powered by lithium ion batteries. And if you look at these uh, batteries, and think about what are the science and the technologies in these batteries that enable the chemical energy to be uh, converted to electricity. There's a lot to be said. Um, more interestingly, I think uh, we can see the emerging uh, applications for energy storage are in uh, fossil free transportation, such as electric cars. Uh, in the electric cars, okay, there are 7,000 of this scale of batteries, right? So besides the differences in sizes, there are other critical differences that why research is necessary. Uh, for example, not many of us would like to change our cars every two or three years, like what we did to our cell phone. So which means that scientists and engineers have to work out ways that have the battery materials in the batteries uh, are much more robust and reliable, that they can last for a decade or longer. And the other big difference is that it is not easy to have zero to 60 mile accelerations in less than four seconds, which means that you have to extract a huge amount of energy content with very short period that have a very stringent requirement on the battery materials, okay? And uh, the next big application for energy storage technologies will be the renewable energy sources. We all know that solar and wind, they are intermittent energy sources. They are significant towards reducing carbon dioxide emission. However, these energy sources, they must be stored and applied, uh, being used when the demand comes. So in this particular area, energy storage technologies are still immature. The ones that rely on electrochemical reactions like batteries. Uh, scientists are working very hard trying to find Earth's abundant elements that could enable us to lower the cost of energy storage, lower the cost of batteries by a factor of five or even 10. So, Hopefully, uh, by glancing at this picture, uh, you could realize that uh, uh, there is a very uh, comprehensive program now in the Jacobs School of Engineering that we are tackling the challenge for energy storage. And our goal is to be able to bring the electric cars to your home at cost of $30,000 or less. Um, we would like to have that to happen in less than a decade of time. And uh, the next picture I would like to show you, um, I think many of you probably did not know that UC San Diego has our own 45 megawatt microgrid. We are indeed a living laboratory for sustainability. In fact, UC San Diego produces more than 90% of the electricity ourselves. And uh, um, I think more exciting for me is that uh, there's more than 15% of penetration of the solar and we are getting really large battery energy storage to stabilize the grid. Because when the solar penetration goes beyond 20%, the grid, the inter intermittency of the solar could introduce a lot of the, this, um, this uh, st instability to the grid. So we will need uh, large batteries to stabilize the grid. 
So uh, with these uh, resources, I think uh, I could argue why UCSD should take the lead. So um, there's a very famous strategist in China named Sun Zi who have said that if you would like to win the big battle, there are three things are necessary. First thing is location. Right? I don't have to tell you UCSD or San Diego is the perfect place for sustainability uh, research because we have so much sunshine. Our climate is really perfect. You know, our batteries don't have to go through the minus 20 degree Celsius test. So for the first generation of the test, this is the perfect location. Second important thing, timing, right? I think right now is not, there's no other better timing than now uh, as California is progressing towards a greener future and the governor Jerry Brown has claimed that we would like to reduce the carbon dioxide below, 40% below the 1990 level. That's a big challenge for all the Californian people to think about how we can get there. And the third very important thing is the team. So the next couple of slides, I hope to show you that the Jacobs School of Engineering and Physical Sciences, we have formed an uh, interdisciplinary team to tackle this great challenge. So the first example I would like to show you is to convince you that battery is also a living system, right? A lot of um, the public media think UCSD is very famous for biological system. I could argue battery is a biological system. Let me show you the movie here, okay? So this is the x-ray shines on this battery while the battery is being operated. You see these spot change and one line become two line. This is the actual change occurred when battery is being operated. It's just that your eyes cannot see it. It can only be visualized by x-rays, right? So think about the human bodies. When we get sick, we go to x-rays, we go to MRIs. I'm the doctor for batteries. <laughs> I can tell the companies what happened in the batteries when battery is being operated, if this reaction is completely reversible, which we hope that is the case, or if there's some catastrophic event that prevent the reversible reaction occur in the batteries. And this work is actually an interdisciplinary collaboration between my group and the Professor Oleg Shiprikos' group in physics, and we were very honored to receive the Chancellor's Interdisciplinary Research Award, which made this collaboration possible. And the second example I would like to show you, again, connect to the big data medicine analogy. Here, we apply the big data approach to materials discovery. So you probably don't know, for materials from lab to market, in the traditional way of testing, validation, prototyping, feedback, it takes about 15 to 20 years for the materials to, from discovered in the lab all the way to being marketed. Today, scientists have a better way of doing this lab to market thanks to the advancement in the computational materials research. So Jacobs School of Engineering have performed the so-called materials genome initiative hire. So we hired people from computer science um, community to help us to look into you know, all the existing known materials. What are the genomes in these materials that could help us to design better materials for energy applications? So this approach is actually adopted by the White House. President uh, Obama even said that uh, this uh, um, materials genome initiative, this approach could help us to accelerate lab to market uh, in materials discovery and applications. And the last example, since I come from the Department of Nano Engineering, I have to say something fantastic about nano. Right? So um, what you're looking at the pictures are the actual atomic resolution pictures of the materials that in your cell phone. Okay? This is the material that before the battery is being used. Okay? So what you're looking at, these little dot, 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 um, they are actually the transition metal arrays in your 
battery. And between those layers, these red arrows are the pathway for the lithium ion to move in and out of the materials. So, you know, when scientists typically show you the cartoon picture of how structure look like, this is not cartoon. This is actual a visualization of how the materials look like at the resolution of 0 0.8 Armstrong, which means less than one nanometer. Okay, this is the instrument today that is not available 10 years ago. Today, what nano engineering and nano scientists can do. And this new instrument could enable us now to look at how materials degradate. For instance, in this battery materials, the before and after, you see the surface has a lot of the bright dot come to the empty layers. These are the in obstacles, the blocks for lithium transport. That's where it slows down your batteries and your battery lose capacitors, capacities. So this optimization of the materials at the atomistic level is one of the exciting new things that have been happening in nanoscience and nanoengineering. And when I talk about the team, I think faculties are important, but more importantly is that we have great students and we are working on to get the next generation workforce for green energy ready. And I really like the expression on their face. I hope that reminds you when you are 16 or 20 years old, the spark on their face are just really, really exciting. So um, to conclude, I hope I have convinced you that uh, the green energy sustainability research is really an interdisciplinary uh, field where physical science engineers, economists, um, even people in uh, um, policy and uh, marketing, we all have to come together and to work on this challenge. And uh, I want to thank my dean for provide, Dean Pisano for provide a platform for us. The Sustainable Power and Energy Center was formed uh, earlier this year in Jacobs School of Engineering. And uh, we're also very fortunate to get the support from the campus because we think we are pro uh, performing the duty of protecting the planet. So I welcome all of you to come and explore with us the opportunities, collaborate with us, and support us. Thank you very much. <laughs>